patients have hepatitis. Yeah, so you yeah, can yeah. Go around and, exactly. and help us out. Yeah. Right. yeah. And uh, you know uh, Professor Zhang Xingxing from Shanghai, do you? I do you not. Know, good, good day. Yeah, you know each other. And with Jack, uh, I'm sure you know Jack yeah. well. Hey, Jack. Good day, John. Well, so Melbourne is getting brother. better? Beg your pardon? M Melbourne is getting better, Jack? Uh, yes, slowly. Uh, yes. We are still in lockdown. Uh, well, all our um, uh, restaurants are closed at night and um, we cannot gather more than two people. And um, yes. it's, um, well, but the people are going around in the daytime on the streets, but all the uh, golf course, um, sports facilities, the swimming pools are closed. And all the beaches are closed. It's terrible. How yes. about you? Uh, we're under stage four, so we're limited to five kilometers uh, from home. Uh, all shops except for supermarkets, uh, we can get takeaway. Um, everything else is closed. Petrol stations are open. We're allowed one hour's worth of exercise per day, but only within a five kilometer zone. And we've got these restrictions until about the 13th of September. And we're all kind of holding our breaths, waiting for it to, to come through. Um, but we have reduced, the, there has been a significant drop. So it is working, which is good to hear. Ah, how it's about the tennis court? Uh, no. <laughs> no tennis court, no Nothing. golf course, golf. But in Melbourne, it's the middle of winter. So it's 13 degrees Celsius out, no, not even that. It's about eight degrees Celsius. Oh, okay. And it's All right. Windy, and it's windy and nobody wants to be outside anyway. So if we're going to do stage four, this is a perfect time to do it. How do you define stage four? What is the um, criteria? Yeah, I mean, that's, they're just the restrictions that we're under. And I think they make it up as they go. I make it up. <laughs> you know, oh, that's a good answer. <laughs> they make uh, it up. <laughs> I think so too. There are no, no international criteria, lack of scientific basis. I don't understand these levels of lockdown. <laughs> no, and stage four is something to be feared, you know. It's yes. <laughs> oh, so Yashumi, are you here? Rose, are you here? Yes, yes, we're Good. here. I can you. see the beautiful lady Rose. <laughs> um, um, okay. Now it's start t time. Time yes, to start. Uh, we, we should start. So, um, uh, Jack, uh, you start and then uh, get John, and then the Rosa will get uh, Professor Jiang Xing. Yeah. Is that the right. wrong? I'll start That's off. The way around. So, Rose will start. Okay. We'll do. Um, is it me? Uh, are we already on? Yes. Yes, please. Okay. Uh, a very warm welcome to all of you to this uh, puzzle capitalist webinar episode three. So my name is Rusmawati Mohammed, I'm the co-chair of the Coalition to Eradicate Varietatis in the Asia Pacific. And to, together with me today is Jack Wallace, who's the executive council member of CEPHA, and will moderate today's session. So we have two wonderful talks by two great speakers this afternoon. The first will be the introduction to the Coalition for Global Hepatitis Elimination. I think we're all very familiar what the global hepatitis strategy is all about. But I think we need to be reminded that the ultimate goal of this strategy is to eliminate viral hepatitis as a public health problem. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome the first speaker, Dr. John Ward, who is the director and founder of the Coalition for Global Hepatitis Elimination, the Task Force for Global Health. John? Yes, thank you uh, so much, uh, Rose. It's uh, so nice to be here. I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, join the Apostle uh, webinar series today to talk about the global, uh, uh, our, uh, our launch of the uh, Coalition for Global Hepatitis uh, Elimination. Uh, and so what I'd like to do is um, share my screen and um, Hopefully everyone can see that. Um, so, so the Coalition for Global Hepatitis Elimination uh, was started in July of 2019. Uh, 
as a part of uh, the effort uh, to strengthen uh, the capacity of elimination programs at the national and subnational level to help them accomplish their goals through technical assistance, knowledge generation, and dissemination and advocacy uh, uh, among partners united in a community of practice, meaning partners coming to the table with different resources and different technical skills, joining together with a common goal of reaching these elimination targets that have been set for us by the uh, uh, WHO and the World uh, uh, Health uh, Assembly. The, the idea of forming a coalition actually started uh, almost uh, 10 years ago when I was working as the director of the Division of Viral Hepatitis and uh, I met uh, uh, members of the Zheshan Foundation uh, from Hong Kong who uh, were interested in improving hepatitis B prevention, particularly in China, particularly mother to child transmission. Uh, WHO was having financial problems in doing their part of a project at that point, And we assembled the resources from Zheshan to help WHO evaluate the China vaccination program, which was in a growth phase at the moment to document their successful increases in coverage for vaccine and the successful achievement of reductions in prevalence than less than 1% among vaccinated children. Uh, that led uh, to me forming a viral hepatitis action coalition at the CDC Foundation, bringing together a larger number of partners to help CDC accomplish priorities for hepatitis prevention. We would, would not be able to do otherwise in the areas of operational research, surveillance, providing technical assistance to other countries. And then as we move from the prevention to the elimination era for hepatitis, uh, really helping form some of the first elimination programs um, and uh, then forming various summits and other activities related to elimination. So why a coalition for global hepatitis elimination? First of all, we all know that this is a very large problem. Uh, 400 million people infected or more, 1.3 million deaths per year. Uh, we've set ambitious goals for ourselves to, to be reached in a relatively short time frame. 65% uh, reduction in mortality, 90% reduction in incidence. Um, and then um, we all uh, are mindful of the uh, limited resources. That's often the case for, uh, for hepatitis related work. And the fact that it's often coming from multiple sources rather than from one or several, as in the case for larger initiatives such as AIDS or TB and malaria elimination. Uh, I moved over to the task force for global health from CDC. Uh, about one year ago uh, because uh, they run about seven other global elim elimination programs and they have these coalitions that help to do that work and, and do that work successfully. And then lastly, several uh, 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 advisory bodies recommended a, a, a coalition for global hepatitis elimination to build that capacity. We then brought together, the task force brought together a variety of different uh, partners to support the coalition, ranging from uh, governmental partners here in the United States, a variety of uh, industry partners, as well as uh, nonprofits and uh, individuals. Uh, the work is guided by a technical advisory board uh, relevant to Asia uh, with my colleagues from Pakistan, uh, India, Thailand, uh, China, um, and uh, Australia. Uh, and, and then we strive to do our work in five uh, areas of service. Number one, building that community of practice. Number two, bringing together evidence that helps people get their work done. Number three, technical assistance, whether it be distance-based or on-site, uh, coordinating operational research, and then uh, doing, our help, doing our part to increase the visibility of hepatitis elimination activities and uh, advocacy and bringing more partners to the table. So let me give you some examples of the work in each of those areas. As far as building the community of practice, we have over a hundred partners now that have uh, partner pages, whether they be at the national level around the world, uh, sub-national uh, such as programs such as uh, Punjab India, uh, micro elimination projects of various types, civil society, and I wanna thank uh, Sebhap for being an early partner 
uh, both Jack and Ginny Johnston really you know, provide some early comments to help uh, get the uh, um, coalition going on the right track. And then we participate in various advisory bodies around the world. And then we really strive to promote collaborations uh, in the different areas that I'll be showing uh, you uh, in a moment. The other work we've done is bringing together data to, to describe the burden of hepatitis and what's being done in response to it for over 190 countries. And we bring that to data uh, from, uh, we're compiling that at relatively no charge from credible sources uh, that are listed for you here. And then we present the information shown here on the right using China as an example. Uh, for uh, first, uh, if you look at the overview, uh, it gives you the resources uh, that are being uh, shared by those partners in that country, whether it be their plans, their tools, valuations, uh, published uh, information, et cetera, the partners they're working with. And then at the tabs above, you see uh, hepatitis B and hepatitis C provides more uh, quantitative information of, uh, in, primarily about what's going on. So for example, in the epidemiologic area, you have um, estimates of prevalence uh, and mortality for hepatitis B or hepatitis C. This is showing hepatitis C here. Um, from model data, such as from the Global Burden of Disease Program, or, or national data as well, if available. And then that's presented in a tabular form as well as in line graphs, so you can see the trend over time. And then both of those are downloadable for your for individual use for PowerPoint presentations, et cetera, as are the data themselves behind these figures, and you can and you can link straight to the original source. Uh, for program monitoring, it, tracking uh, elements, important elements such as vaccination coverage for that uh, important birth dose uh, of hepatitis B vaccination, uh, uh, coverage with infant immunization, the uh, access for people who inject drugs to clean injection equipment in the case of hepatitis C, again, uh, available in uh, tabular or uh, line graph form. The policy environment, does that country have a national action plan? What are their testing policies? What are their vaccination policies? Do they have access to low cost hepatitis B and hepatitis C therapies um, and other aspects around um, um, uh, in prevention, uh, for, such as for um, uh, people who inject drugs, access to um, drug treatment. We then make that uh, information uh, available uh, in infographics. So uh, shown here, we, we, we show the different um, levels of coverage of um, uh, vaccine, for example, uh, by WHO region, uh, and also uh, what's the uh, proportional uh, pr uh, contribution of prevalence and mortality uh, of the different uh, WHO regions. And then they're available, as you see here on the far right, in a uh, hopefully uh, easily um, uh, understood and readily shared uh, one pagers that are available uh, currently for, at the region for regions. And now progressively, we're developing those in collaboration with in-country partners uh, for, uh, for countries so that these can be used uh, to uh, uh, educate more stakeholders and more partners to hopefully bring more partners to the table and improve our capacity. We're then uh, strengthening the evidence base for program development. So we've done systematic reviews of how to deliver hepatitis B birth dose in a variety of different settings. We did a systematic review of the action plans available and identified 99 action plans at the national and subnational level. And then obviously in the midst of COVID, we had to uh, change our focus a bit and we did some work to uh, better understand and present the relationship between SARS-CoV-2 infection and chronic liver disease. We did a, uh, an epidemiologic update for the journal of clinical liver disease and then George Lau of Hong Kong and I uh, joined together to, um, uh, to lay out a comparative analysis of the recommendations coming from the various 
liver associations, of, of course, including the apostle to help people uh, readily understand what's being recommended for changes in their, in their practice. In addition, we recently launched a survey uh, to uh, understand what is the impact of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic on the delivery of the essential services needed to achieve elimination, vaccination, testing, treatment, as well as changes within the practice to protect healthcare workers uh, and patients. We recently launched that about two weeks ago. We're distributing that within the United States, Canada, and Easel will distribute it in Europe beginning next month. Really would like to talk to Apostle about sharing that among Apostle members um, uh, going forward. Um, the other key area I thought we could be helpful in, in, in talking to colleagues around the world was the, uh, the relative small amount of data from low and middle income countries and from other marginalized or resource constrained settings. They're really limited getting information out in the peer review literature that's so important for policy development with, or from or, with organizations such as WHO. So um, being a former MMWR editor at CDC, uh, I'm used to working with authors to get their work done. So we uh, really have made that editorial assistance available, launched a new series of innovations in hepatitis elimination uh, for the journal Clinical Liver Disease as a way to uh, have a channel to get that information out more uh, quickly. And we launched that last month with our first uh, article and I look forward to doing uh, those articles now on a, on a monthly basis. So I provided a, a web link uh, for people getting more information uh, and I really uh, would look forward to, uh, to hearing from anyone who uh, would have some interest in publishing in this uh, way and would benefit from this type of editorial assistance. Uh, we do receive uh, questions of different types uh, from different parts of the world uh, regarding vaccination, infection control, testing, et cetera. So we're launching a help desk uh, for hepatitis elimination so we can better systematically receive these questions and then disseminate the answers to that so that everyone can benefit from that. And obviously doing that with authoritative bodies such as from WHO, APOSL, uh, US CDC, uh, and our technical advisory board. Uh, we're also uh, 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 providing assistance in a little bit more of an in-depth manner, uh, starting with uh, helping countries look at their burden of disease, their te testing capacity, and then bringing that together to see uh, what capacity is best directed to reaching those key populations that have the highest prevalence of hepatitis B or hepatitis C, what are the gaps, and then putting that information together with the price of testing the price of treatment into a model that's been developed by Dr. Jack Chatwall at Harvard uh, that will develop a budget-based plan for that country. And we're going to be launching JAG's uh, model on the coalition website so that that tool is available at no charge uh, to any country that might want to use it uh, over and above the direct technical assistance that we're providing currently for countries such as Ghana, Vietnam, of beginning to do some work with Thailand, Tanzania, um, and some other countries. And then helping them bring coalitions together at the national level to act on those plans um, in a coordinated way uh, to, really, to really put those plans into action. On the operational research uh, side, we've been uh, working with a variety of partners to help answer the question, what is the best uh, second line treatment for, uh, for uh, patients who fail first line treatment for their hepatitis C infection in low and middle income countries where they rec recommended patented three uh, dose, three drug regimen is not available. So we've been working in the countries as you can see here, in addition to CHI uh, to help answer that question, the percent of success of those second line treatments are shown in the column on the far right showing that a variety of different regiments appear to be um, highly effective. So we're now beginning to pull this information together for uh, presentations and publication so they can form uh, future updates to uh, WHO uh, treatment policies. 
while we're looking to develop a prospective study, this is a retrospective study, which would strengthen that evidence base, uh, which is very important for the uh, treatment guideline process. As far as advocacy, oh, we do a variety of different things, but one I, I really particularly uh, uh, excited about is an opportunity to rec recognize what I call hepatitis elimination champions. I'm always struck by the remarkable work of individuals for hepatitis elimination who oftentimes in resource constrained settings by the virtue of their own skills and passion make remarkable progress um, in, um, in a variety of different ways. I just put up some examples here, you know, relevant to Asia, work in China to uh, extend vaccine coverage in rural uh, north uh, western China, uh, working with government officials to decrease uh, laws and regulations that limited education and employment opportunities for people living with hepatitis B, and then people, uh, individuals in, in New Zealand and in India that were developing new care models that were appropriate uh, and effective for their countries. You know, looking forward, we, you know, we're only about a, a year into this, so we're continuing to uh, grow the number of uh, programs that are contributing information through their program pages uh, as part of this community of practice. We look forward to expanding our information um, and uh, technical assistance and uh, uh, operational research uh, resources. Uh, we're really you know, looking to identify opportunities from the COVID-19 response, recognizing the changes in clinical practice that could uh, expand access to vital services um, and uh, the changes in diagnostic platform availability that could also provide new opportunities to um, test people living with hepatitis B and hepatitis C and get them into uh, care and treatment. Um, and then with our uh, looking at priorities for technical assistance, particularly um, eliminating uh, mother to child transmission of hepatitis B, in part uh, assisting this, the new triple elimination strategies, continuing to look for ways to simplify hepatitis B and hepatitis C testing and linkage to care, and obviously improving the quality of strategic information. But lastly, I did want to point out that you know, AASOD and EASL are members of, uh, of the coalition. Uh, they sit on the executive board. Uh, and they, uh, we have, uh, we're working with them in a variety of different collaborative ways as, as are listed here. And I just uh, wanted to uh, uh, end with an invitation for, uh, for APOSL um, to um, become a partner uh, in the coalition, uh, join EASL and uh, ASLD, um, uh, directing uh, and advising how the coalition uh, should grow to, uh, to uh, meet the needs of those organizations uh, and its members um, and how we can collaborate in educational research and advocacy opportunities and then join forces with others working in the area such as SEVHAP you know, and other regional partners so that we all can meet, work together and meet the goals that we all share which is the elimination of hepatitis B and hepatitis C by 2030. Uh, thank you very much. I uh, look forward to a question and answer session and, and obviously uh, please contact me at jward at taskforce.org. I uh, look forward to collaborating with you in the future. Thank you very much, John, for a very comprehensive overview of the coalition. Um, there are already two questions um, here in the panel. Uh, are you able to see them? I think what, I, I will start with the first one. Um, we haven't got any from the audiences yet, but I think your data showed that very few countries uh, reported on the mortality data, particularly for hepatitis C. Do you think that the focus on capturing data from, from countries or even from the WHO regions should be first on the diagnosis and the treatment rates? And that uh, will probably be easier to capture rather than the mortality data. That's a very good question. Uh, strategic information, or really the lack of it, is a is a is a key stumbling block for uh, for the hepatitis elimination effort. Um, and so, I think with countries that do have good mortality data, that's obviously the first place that you want to go. But uh, many countries do not. 
So I think uh, what will have to happen is uh, see how, uh, how, how, how we can strengthen the evidence around prevalence, uh, how many people are getting treated, uh, recognition of something about new infections from high-risk populations, and then uh, probably uh, rely on modeling uh, to, um, to help us track progress toward an elimination goal to, uh, to help us come up with a uh, presumptive uh, achievement of a goal. And then with some, probably some um, confirmation step where you're looking at um, uh, liver cancer registries or hospital records or something else to verify that. And I say all that because WHO is in the process of looking at what are the right databases and the feasible databases that can be used to help countries track progress toward these elimination goals. So we're really, <clears throat> pardon me, we're right in the midst of looking through those, uh, uh, through those issues uh, in collaboration uh, with WHO. That's a very good question, thank you. I can't hear you. Uh, Jack has a question for you, and there's also one question from the audience. Um, Jack asks, how can the PASA members uh, support the coalition? Well, I think the, co we, the it, it's, it's a two-way street. We want the co we would like, we want partners who are working on elimination, national, subnational, and, and large organizations like APOSL to come together, share their work on program pages uh, on the coalition, including links to their own websites if they have them, so that people better understand what's going on all around the world, who they could be working with that could help them do the work in their country because they're working on the same population or on the same intervention. And then we're strengthening each other's work through this collaborative process. And then by raising the visibility of our work, we, I believe we can engage more partners that can bring more resources to the table, more expertise that can help us all do our work. So I think uh, I would really appreciate APOSL members uh, contacting me to uh, begin to share that information so that we truly are a global coalition, sharing our information and, and working uh, together. All right, thank you. So there's a question here from Nepal, um, from Professor Chowdhury. Any United Nations efforts for hepatitis elimination that you are aware? The United Nations, uh, of course, WHO is an affiliate of the United Nations, and so by extension, those elimination targets are in some ways related to the United Nations, but specifically related to the United Nations are the Sustainable Development Goals, which are very broad, cover a wide number of areas, but relevant to hepatitis, there's a specific uh, SDG for hepatitis B uh, reductions among uh, children less than five years of age. So there's a, a specific targets of reaching a less than uh, 1% and then 0.1% prevalence among children less than five. And so again, on those dashboards, we have a specific column to look at that uh, measure and how many countries have already reached that target and how many countries need to do more to reach that, uh, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal of less than a 1% uh, prevalence. So please go to the website and look at that um, uh, information. Uh, fortunately, many countries in the Western Pacific region have achieved those goals because of the regional uh, commitment to hepatitis B prevention for, for young children. Uh, and, and fortunately, other countries are beginning uh, to, um, to do the same with probably the greatest challenges remaining are in the uh, countries of Africa. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, Jack, can you detect any more questions? I... I don't see any more questions so far, but if all attendees, uh, please use the Q&A function of Zoom or the chat function on Zoom. Uh, if you have more kind of issues that you'd like to raise. Um, and should we go on to the next speaker? Yeah, yeah. Um, and John, thank you so much for 
being able to do a presentation at a terrible time for, <laughs> um, in terms of the day. <laughs> well, I'm happy to. Please, please contact me. I look forward to working with you all, as always. Thank you. Thank and you. our next presentation comes from Professor Xingxing Zhang from the Research Laboratory of Clinical Virology. And my apologies if I've mispronounced your name. My Chinese is terrible. Xingxing, thank you. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, no problem. Okay. Okay, well, uh, good afternoon or good morning, uh, dear professors and dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great uh, pleasure for me to discuss with you concerning the combination therapy of PAC interferon and the nucleoside nucleotide analogs in chronic hepatitis B. As you know, the chronic HPV infections is a global health problem, which may lead to cirrhosis or even HCC without effective antiviral therapy. So the goal of the treatment is to eliminate the virus, decrease the inflammation of hepatocyte, and also to uh, prevent the cirrhosis and to the HCC. And for the definition of functional cure, we have the serial HBV DNA undetectable and also most importantly is the S loss with or without serial conversion. Unfortunately, the S loss rate under current therapy is very low. For pegylated interferon treated each year, about only 5%. And for the nucleoside one-year therapy, maybe uh, almost zero for the S loss. So, so for the mechanism of the viral persistence, mainly due to the CCC DNA in the nucleus of the hepatocyte and also the defective of CD8 response and the B cell response, and also the efficiency of innate response. And under the current therapy, we have two kinds of therapy. One is pegylated interferon, another is nucleoside nucleotide analogs. And the limitation of monotherapy is evident. For example, for the pegylated interferon, not well tolerated. And for the nuke therapy, for most of patients, it needs left line therapy. And the S antigen clearance is very low for the monotherapy. And also the slow kinetics of CCC DNA decline. So the possible uh, resolution uh, method for this problem may be the combination therapy. Before we have the new antiviral drugs, maybe we can try the combination therapy. We have several kinds of combination method. One is de novo therapy, another is add-on and also switch to. The possible advantages of the combination strategy for impagulated interferon may due to the reduce the risk of drug resistance of nukes, induce cytotoxic T cell activities, and lead to the immune clearance of infected cells by immunomoderator action. And for the nukes, may rapidly reduce the viral replication and viral protein and improve the responsiveness of immune system to immune moderators such as interferon. So first is a de novo combination therapy. This is PAX's phase three clinical trials, maybe the first de novo combination therapy, which has been published uh, 2005 by George Kekela professor and the groups. And this is 
multi-center randomized partial double-blind studies. And there are three groups in these studies. One is pegylated alpha 2A uh, with placebo, and another is pegylated interferon with lamivudine, and uh, the third group is lamivudine only. And the rate of E0 conversion and HVV DNA response was higher in the combination groups than lamivudine alone at 72 weeks. However, there are no difference between the combination and the pegylated interferon alone on the rate of E0 conversion and the biological response. And also the Paxis phase three uh, clinical trial study in E antigen negative patients novel combination therapy. And the rate of biochemical and biological response was higher in combination group than lamivudine alone at 72 weeks. However, there's no difference between combination therapy and the pegylated alone on the rate of biological response and the HVV uh, biological response and the e And this is another investigator initiate randomized double-blind study control trial and also from uh, 42 centers of 15 countries. This is also the novel combination therapy in E-antigen positive patients. And they compare also the lamivudine combined with pegylated interferon and the interferon alone. In these studies, the rate of E-antigen e loss and the HVV DNA response was higher in lamivudine combined with PAC interferon therapy then PAC interferon alone, but it relapsed during follow-up. And also Professor Maslan and uh, the groups have tried, tried the terapivitin combined with pegylated interferons in, also in the E-antigen positive patients. And they find that the combination therapy may lead to a rapid, a profound decline in HVV DNA and the greater reduction in E antigen in this in these studies. But the severe polyneuropathic development in the combination therapy. So this kind of combination therapy could not be used in clinic. And how about tenofovir comb combination therapies? They also do the uh, investigations on this kind of combination. And this is, in this study, there are 58% is E antigen positive patients. And also this uh, randomized the open label active control multinational trials. And they have four groups. One is tenofovir with pegylated interferon for 48 weeks. Another is pegylated interferon only for 48 weeks. And the third is the combination, but only with 16 weeks and continue the tenofovir only. And the fourth group is tenofovir only. And very interestingly in this study, seven patients has S, S zero conversions on or after 48 weeks. And the, among the seven patients, four was, were in the treated by the tenofovir with pegylated combination therapy. And the three and also with the combination therapy, but with short combination time. And the, in this study, they also find the tenofovir combined with pegylated interferon treatment for 48 weeks, reduce S antigen decline 
in the combination groups. And recently, another study is the novel combination in E antigen positive patients. And this is a retrospective studies with PAG interferon only group and PAG later interferon combined with tenofovir. And in this study, they, there is no difference when the treatment on the with uh, 24 weeks, but after the 48 weeks treatment, the difference between these two groups. And you can see the rate of S loss in the combination groups was higher than the interferon group at week 48. However, the rate of E antigen zero conversion and the E antigen loss was similar between these two groups. There is a meta-analysis including 17 studies concerning the E antigen positive treatment naive patients. And they conclude that the nucleotide and interferon combination therapy had better efficacy in S antigen loss, E antigen loss, E antigen zero conversion, and the HVV DNA undetectable rate compared to the nuc monotherapy at the end of treatment. However, there were no difference in S antigen zero conversion. So the second is the sequential combination therapy, including add-on pegylated interferon or add-on nuc. So this study is a global investigator initiate open label multi-center randomized trial involving 175 patients. And these E antigen positive patients after anticovia treatment for 24 weeks, the one group is continued anticovia monotherapy, another group is combined with pegylated interferon for 24 weeks. And they found that the S for the S antigen, the combination therapy, uh, combination therapy group S decreased significantly compa compared with the mono anticovia anti monotherapy. And also for the HVV DNA decrease also has different significant difference between these two groups. However, no difference in the E antigen loss. And another study uh, made in Shanghai is also the add-on pegylated interferon in E antigen positive patients. And this is the patients have previously long-term anticovid treatment more than two years. And the two groups, which one is add-on pegylated interferon and another is anticovia monotherapy continuously. This is retrospective studies. And the, in these studies, they found that E0 conversion rate is different between these two groups. And also the S antigen, the, the e, S antigen decline and the E antigen decline also have difference between the combination therapy and the anticovid monotherapies. And also another study is also uh, on the add-on pegylated interferon in E antigen positive patients. And they have investigated in the patients with long-term nucleoside nucleotide analog therapies. And after that, two groups, one is continued to nucleoside nucleotide analog monotherapy, another with 48 weeks of pegylated interferon. And in this study, they also find that add-on therapy induced more S antigen decline at week 72 than nuke monotherapy. But 
relapse after the for, uh, during the follow up. And this is also another study is also is add on paralytic interferon in E antigen plus Q patients. And they conclude also the more S antigen decline and the E0 conversion than the anticovid monotherapy. And the, how about the E antigen negative uh, patients? And this, study, this study is add on the pegylated interferon in E antigen negative patients and with genotype D infected and the ongoing new therapy and HVV DNA is undetectable. And also they find that the new therapy significantly the add-on pegylated interferon to ongoing new therapy is significantly decrease S level. And uh, how about the add-on nuke? This study have investigated the patient treated by pegylated interferon 12 weeks and with poor virological response. That means no early virological response. And they, for this patient, they divided it to three groups. One is add-on. Antacovir, another is adafovir, and the one is continue the pegylated interferon for 48 weeks. And they found that for the HPV DNA decrease, the combination add-on nukes have significantly decreased in HPV DNA levels. And also for the S antigen decrease, however, there is no difference in E antigen serial conversions after the add on the nukes for pegylated interferon poor response patients. So the second point is to switch to pegylated therapy. And this is study made by Wuhan by Professor Ni. They study the switch to pegylated interferon in E antigen positive patients. And they studied the patients treated by anticovid previously more than nine months or three years. And the HBV DNA is undetectable and oh, less than 10.3 copies per male. And the E antigen is less than 100 p unit. And one group is continued anticovid monotherapy and another is after short combination therapy switch to interferon uh, monotherapy. And in this study, they also find E0 conversion and the S loss and the HBV DNA less uh, response was significantly higher in pegylated interferon group. And this is another study switched to PEG interferon therapy. And they have E antigen positive and negative patients at the same time. And therapy for then four years, they switched to PEG interferon for 48 weeks. And another group is continue monotherapy with nukes. And we can see here, they also from the S changes from baseline, that these two groups has different difference. That mean the switch to package interferon has more S declines. So another meta analysis including uh, 24 studies, they compare the de novo strategy and the new experience that the strategies. And they conclude that the compare with the de novo strategies, 
the new experience was found to likely to achieve S loss. And concerning the add-on and the switch strategies, they found that the compared with add-on strategies, the switch to strategy was found to more likely to achieve S loss. And the results of combination therapy are promising and encouraging, but the different strategy seems in sometimes inconclusive. And in our groups, we have do some exploring study with tenofovir combined with PAC interference therapy. And we compare the sequential combination therapy with the novel combination therapy. And we have three groups of patients. One is tenofovir for two years. Another is tenofovir for 48 for the first uh, uh, 48 weeks and the sequential combination with pack-related interferon. And the third group is the novel combination therapy at the first 48 weeks and continue for the monotherapy with uh, another uh, one year. And the, no difference at the baseline, the clinical characters for among these uh, three groups. And not only the preliminary results, and for the HBV DNA declines and the biological uh, response, there are no difference between these two groups, three groups. And interestingly, we find that the pegylated interferon sequential combination therapy induces higher rate of S loss and the more S decline at week 96 weeks. This is, um, we think it's very interesting compa compared with the sequential combination therapy and the de novo combination therapy. And we think maybe due to the, see, if we take the new therapy at first and the, the HBV DNA level will decrease significantly and that they will be benefit for the a re-establish of the, the immune system. And then after that, if we add on the moderate immune moderator, maybe the, 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 the effectiveness may be improved. And finally, I just summarized the, the, which I have talked, that is the efficacy of antiviral treatment for chronic hepatitis B remained unsatisfactory. And before we have the new uh, antiviral agents, maybe we can try the different combination therapy of different uh, strategy may encourage results on E0 conversion and uh, very interestingly on S loss. And the individual strategies are needed for improving the efficacy. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Zhang. We have a couple of questions in the in the Q and A uh, section. Section. Um, the first one comes from Kenichi Furuya, who asks: In combination therapy with PEG interferon and nukes, IL twelve and some cytokines may be induce cytotoxic Th one and CDE eight activities. How about any influence inducing TH17 and regulatory, tel regulatory T cell populations by continuous viral inflammation? Now, my apologies, I am not a, a, a clinician, so I have no idea if I've butchered that question. Jing Jing Zhang, can you respond? Yes. Uh, some studies have showed that the, after the, uh, the, the combination therapy, the immune system has uh, improved, such as the TH17, TH17 uh, decrease, on the, and also the, uh, something like the uh, immune, uh, uh, the, the innate immune response 
established uh, compared the before and the after the therapy. Uh, personally, I don't do this study, but I, I can I, I saw some studies have uh, proved this improvement. Maybe this the the the, the mechanism strategies. Mm. But I think decrease the the HBV DNA level. DNA level at first, I think this may be uh, more important for better uh, re-establish the immune system reaction. Jan, um, can I ask the questions? No problem. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Professor Zhang, this is uh, really an, an excellent summary of uh, all the uh, combinations in terms of de novo sequentials for chronic hepatitis B, uh, trying to achieve a functional cure. Uh, with the availability of the quantitation service antigens, I just wonder whether in your studies and in others, uh, you have a chance to look at the, the impact on the quantitation service antigen itself, because we will talk about clearance. So we certainly need to have a reduction of the service antigens preceding the clearance. So um, is there any uh, um, idea of how the decline of the service antigen itself uh, could have an impact on a functional curve, whether this would uh, be uh, um, uh, taken into consideration so into your uh, designs of future therapy. Um, for, the, uh, for the function cure, the most important is the, the de decrease and the, uh, the totally disappearance of the S, uh, S antigens. So I think uh, the first, uh, uh, the important is uh, under the, the HBV, serial HBV DNA is absolutely undetectable under this condition and the S, we detect the S antigen quantification is the under the detectable level. This is important. And uh, we also try to look at the by biopsy, we will look at in the hepatocyte uh, the, the S antigen, uh, the, the quantification, and the, even the uh, CCC DNA. I think this is more uh, important and interesting in, in our next, next step. In our study, we have uh, done some, in some patients, we have done the biopsy uh, in these patients have the, uh, the, the S loss in serum and the, the data is under the ana analysis. And we have done the RNA sequencing. I may seek to, 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 to look at this. Thank you. Uh, can I ask a question? Certainly, please go ahead. Uh, it's uh, nice to see uh, all our colleagues here. I have been working with the hepatitis B deactivation. And uh, many of our patients after reactivation have cleared the virus, but many have persisted with the virus, although the injury subsides. When we do a repeat biopsy and we look into the liver tissue in these patients, with the regression of, uh, with, the, with the decrease in the virus, there is a regression of fibrosis and liver disease. What I want to say is that a reactivation of hepatitis B, which is leading to uh, acute and chronic liver failure or uh, high level of bilirubin and enzymes, uh, is in a way helpful to the patient and it clears the virus with regression of the disease. Now, the question remains is in a proportion of patients, they never get better and the virus continues. So our current challenge is, and as uh, Peggy back or as the as the addition of new can peg is there, we, we cannot do in a patient who is severely jaundiced or has hepatitis B. So my question is, can you have a thought on how do you immune modulate such patients who have got uh, reactivation with flare and uh, liver failure? Do you have any thoughts on this? 
Uh, yes, for this kind of patients, that means that uh, the activation of the uh, uh, the HBV and uh, for the liver failure, we think the take the antiviral drugs. Uh, the the nux is most uh, uh, immediately is important, and uh, of course in this time. I think the PAC interferon is not uh, recommended uh, because maybe the, the immune response is too uh, too too uh, strong. Maybe not uh, will leading to the liver uh, in in lesion injury. I think normally uh, I, we we will prevent this. Sorry. Yeah, the new study was from uh, our group in 2011 using tenofovir, and we showed those patients who have a two log reduction in the DNA have a better outcome. Our problem is even when we have two logs, two nuclei added, even then some patients never have reduction in the virus. You know, they continue 10 raised to power 6, 10 raised to power 8. We add to them both antacover and tenofovir. There is no reduction in the virus for a few weeks. Now, my apologies. We need to wrap this up because we're coming to the end of our time. Um, Professor Zhang, can you make a final comment about that issue? Yes, I think uh, uh, it take for the liver failure patients with the activation of HBV, the the nukes func uh, take the nukes. We should take the nukes for eliminate for decrease the HBV. But this time, uh, the 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 duration of the decrease is not so important for the for the uh, for the ACLF patients. Maybe. Maybe the, the, the sure the decrease is necessary of HBV DNA is necessary, but the time, the the the, the rapidness maybe is not so important for the life of CV. I think. I have one last question to John Ward and Jack. And the last question is, like hepatitis C or HIV, why are we not going to say treat all? for hepatitis B. Sorry, I don't get the meaning. Uh, I, the question is directed to John Ward and Jack Corrales. Uh, okay. The question means uh, we have drugs and today I don't think there is something like an inactive carrier. So we are strongly of the view that we should treat all and at least in India, we have hepatitis B drugs are free. So why don't we champion this? I think that's an excellent topic for uh, for an entire webinar session. <laughs> uh, so I think we just uh, that's a very intriguing point. It's a mixture of first, do no harm. Uh, number one, number two, what's the real benefits for for everyone? Number three, uh, can health systems uh, really? Uh, uh, handle all that huge population. We're having a hard time just with the uh, 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 implementing the current recommendations. So there's a lot, a lot of different elements there that really need full exploration and including with clinicians who've been working with treating hepatitis B for many, many years. So Shiv, I look forward to having a webinar session on that topic. Thank you. <laughs> and remembering the fact that only about 9% of people with hepatitis B globally have been diagnosed. Exactly. So we need to build up those numbers substantially. Um, now, should we bring this to a close? Um, thank you, everybody, for participating. Thank you. John, for your presentation, and Jin Jin Chung for your presentation. Um, and to all the participants, we had over 190 participants uh, attending this, um, this symposium. So I'm deeply grateful for your participation. And we will see you next week, possibly, at the next puzzle uh, secretariat meeting. Webinar, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank Bye. you. Stay safe. Bye. Thank you, George. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, Jack. Pleasure. Pleasure.